Um, when, when I first occupied the chair of this branch way back in the last century, um, the branch had two ancient traditions. One of them was that the last meeting of the year, shortly before Christmas, was members night, when we would have three or four short presentations by members on bees they had in their bonnet. And the other tradition was that when a, pre, uh, a, a term as president or chairman in those days came to an end, the person was supposed to provide a valedictory address. So today we're trying to bring in both of those traditions because um, there will be my bees in the bonnet and um, my impending departure from the chair. I would warn David Morris that he now has two years in which to collect his thoughts. <laughs> um, the paper I gave way back then was called How to Be Happy Though Provincial. And it was about the benefits of not living and working in a metropolis. And I'm still happy to be provincial in this second city of the smallest state of the most provincial nation on earth. An eminent psychiatric colleague who worked at Exeter in England regarded the newly coined term, the then newly coined term, centre of excellence, as it affected tertiary institutions as merely a dirty trick to ensure that the ancient rule of to him that hath shall be given uh, persisted. He referred to his location as the periphery of excellence. <laughs> and that should be our aspiration for the intellectual, professional and creative on system. The world's full of wonderful things and when people want to talk about them, they can't avoid giving them a name. There is an ancient superstition that naming something gives us power over it. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the idea is expressed early in the book of Genesis where God is reported to have given Adam the privilege of naming every living creature. By Bishop Usher's conservative dating, that first exercise in taxonomy took place in the first week of November of 4004 BC. It's a considerable priority even if the publication was to be long delayed. <laughs> You'll notice that at that, that time, um, Adam had yet to be provided with a research assistant. <laughs> From the images that have been found at places like Lascaux and Altamira and Kakadu, it's apparent that Adam's posterity were good observers of living things. Ancient languages appear to give priority to objects that are of importance to people, uh, such as sources of food or of danger. In the Palawa languages of what is now Tasmania, there were names for plants that were of economic importance to people, but the rest of the botanical word, world appears to have been referred to in a very general sort of way, as we refer to bush. Frederick Nietzsche has reported or suggested that primitive people named everything they encountered individually, presumably a manifestation of animism a belief in a spiritual essence in everything. By implication, one of the earliest revolutions in human thought was probably the invention of the common noun and then the collective noun. Margaret Aston makes a wise remark, understanding is always a difficult sort of gift and things are by no means always recognised for what they are at the moment they acquire a name. Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein taught us to question whether the sentences we form can be true reflections of what is or was. Of the words that are the building blocks of those sentences, the nouns are paradoxically more questionable than the verbs. The Staphylococcus aureus undoubtedly caused the inflammation the Ornithorhynchus undoubtedly swam, but what was it that caused? 
What was it that swam? Whatever the truth of that matter, it remains true that those of us who like to classify things individually divide into lumpers and splitters. Those who like to describe phenomena with a broad brush and those who like to split hairs. Charles Darwin recognised this, I think, at the beginning of chapter three of The Origin of Species. He doesn't use the term lumper and splitter, but he does discuss the two different ways of approaching the, the world. To those who like to split hairs, I make you a gift that you may not yet have received. Many years ago, Sir Guy Green introduced me to this, the longest word in the English, Oxford English Dictionary. It's defined as the action or habit of estimating as worthless, but it contains the idea of fluff, flocky, of extreme devaluation, nauki, of nothing, nihili, and of hairs, pili. So it's literally about splitting hairs and turning them into fluff. <laughs> so extreme subdivision in the material world may give us subatomic particles, but in the world of ideas, it merely produces fluff. What I'd like to irritate you with this afternoon is the work of a scatterbrain by nature and upbringing, that's what I am. One parent imagined me becoming an architect or an artist, and the other a medical missionary. Colleagues who work with the young tell me that people's career trajectories are often determined by the errands that their parents send them on. You all know the joke about Rupert Murdoch. His father sent him out to buy a newspaper and he hasn't come home yet. <laughs> This audience has little need to be reminded of the history of modern science, of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus of 1543 and the trouble it caused, of Giordano Bruno burnt at the stake for defending it, for Galileo forced to deny his convictions, of Kepler and Tycho Brahe, of the rebirth of grand theory after Galileo looked through his telescope and found the universe to be no longer finite, of Newton elucidating the laws of motion, bodies like the society that was established in London in 1660 that became royal in 1662 to foster a science based on observation and experiment. Botanists and anatomists had long dissected their subjects to try and understand the mind of the creator and some must have wondered why the creator so often changed his mind. Those who examined the works of mankind found plentiful evidence of this, that divine attribute. After all, we were made in the image of God, and if he indulged in a myriad of special creations, the trial and error of fallen man was only to be expected. When someone got it right, they were to be honored and imitated, and those who wished to do otherwise were criticised or even persecuted until one of them got it right again and the cycle was repeated. In our age of neophilia, for example, we find it difficult to understand how Daruk temples like this were built in more or less the same style for nearly four centuries. They were like trumpet solos in a, as in a Stedford the same set piece performed again and again with greater or lesser skill. The competitors were able to make free choices on the side, but they were mainly to be judged by their performance of the set piece. For centuries, the mythos of natural phenomena dominated people's thinking. The significance of things lay in their meaning, not as objects to be categorised or explained. Scientific rationalism was slow to development, although its roots in the Western tradition were apparent at least from the 15th century. From the 17th century, there'd been a growth of antiquarianism in England, variously attributed to such factors as nostalgia, evoked by the ruins resulting from the dissolution of the monasteries, and from the losses and discoveries following the Great Fire of London. Admiration for the Middle Ages was overtaken by enthusiasm for pre-Christian relics, 
and collections of curiosities often included Stone Age implements, Roman remnants, freaks of nature and fossils. Something new was emerging in the Western minds in the first half of the 18th century, a wish to collect and collate knowledge systematically. This was powerfully stated by the French naturalist and mathematician um, Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, who is generally known as Buffon, the author of the Histoire Naturelle, who wrote in about 1749, let us gather facts in order to have ideas. Biologists will recall that it was Buffon who discovered that crossbreeding could produce infertile offspring, and so he effectively defined a species. By now you'll be painfully aware that nearly everything I'm talking about today is as blindingly obvious as Playfair's axiom. The interesting question is why these matters were not as obvious to generations of people as intelligent as we are or even more so. It seems to me that the principal obstruction to the advancement of science lay in an attitude to belief. It still does when science confronts self-interest or politics or belief in relation to such matters as global warming or vaccination or evolution. A belief in special creation, for example, didn't just oppose a theory of organic evolution, it made it unnecessary, it prevented it. In that great monument to the revolution in thought of the 18th century, Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopédie, produced between 1751 and 1772, D'Alembert called Buffon the great phrase monger. Along with this revolution came a wish to systematise the labelling of living things as part of a dawning recognition that they rose from the operation of natural laws yet to be discovered, as Newton had done for the physical sciences. Similarity and difference were going to be the lenses through which the discovery of those laws might be made. Linnaeus is credited with the consolidation of, if not the invention of, nosology. In, in, of, he invented the binary nomenclature in botany. His genera plantarum was published in 1737. Um, nosology came earlier than taxonomy, which is interesting, suggesting that uh, people's interest in their health was uh, more primary than their interest in uh, examining living things. So, ten years earlier than Linnaeus, physicians had begun to use the word nosology to describe their enterprise of naming the diseases of mankind, a prime example of the ancient belief that to name something was to gain power over it. The term taxonomy didn't appear until the next century. Francois Boissier de Sauvage de La Croix, whose name suggests that he may have been a Frenchman, aspired to be the Linnaeus of disease with his Nosologica Methodica of 1763. Naming things was, not, was well systematised before a name for the enterprise was coined. Sixty years after Linnaeus and thirty after Lacroix came the application of the Linnaean system to the animal kingdom when Georges Cuvier began to adapt it for that purpose. First in his tableau elementaire and then decisively in Le Regne Animal, the animal kingdom, in 1817. Now, 1817 was an interesting year for uh, systematic thought about classification. Of course, in that year, this man appeared, 
His name's Thomas Rickman, and he may not be familiar to many of you. And in that year he published a book which he modestly called An Attempt to Discriminate the Styles of English Architecture from the Conquest to the Reformation. It was arguably the first systematically researched work on the history of architectural style anywhere in the world, based on examination of the buildings themselves and not on a chaos of ideas about their origins. Rickman categorised English medieval architecture, recognising chroni a chronological progression from Norman to early English to decorated to perpendicular. But he also discerned a series of transitions and evolution of style. For light relief, let's look at what he was looking at. Uh, the little one in the bottom corner reminds us that this was an international style, it was not a British one. So in Portugal, you could think it was in England. Then there was the coming of a development from that early English, he called it. And then it became more complicated. And then it became even more complicated in a peculiarly English way. And then things went from bad to worse about the time of the English Reformation. Elizabethan times, and we get Tudor Gothic, the last flowering of Gothic in England before it became a matter of revival. Tudor was the one that got away. Rickman got as far as perpendicular, but he thought Tudor was a version of that, which it probably was. The Continentals, of course, went their own way. The English of, at that time were um, tended to be a bit parochial in their architectural history. Um, and so they claimed that this um, choir in Lincoln Cathedral is the first purely Gothic building in the world, although our Gothic was a French invention. There was a lot of confusion, just as in the case of the descriptive sciences in botany, zoology and geology, the study of the origins of architectural style had been held up by matters of belief. Some of these were mytho-historical, others were sectarian. Regard for um, medieval buildings had a complex history in England. For some, they represented Roman Catholicism and superstition and ignorance. For others, ancient lineage and established freedoms. The latter view determined the controversial choice of Gothic for the Houses of Parliament after the fire of 1834 in England. This is just to show you the sort of thought that um, Batty Langley was involved in. Batty was actually his name. It wasn't short for Bartholomew and it wasn't a nickname. <coughs> if you can work out what he's saying. Then there were the arguments between the contemporary savants about how the, the style arose altogether. Remember was Thomas Wharton in 1762, just as confused as Batty Langley, but believing that um, it was a Saxon style, therefore came from Germany, therefore was anti Italian, 
and there were the others who believed that it came from the Saracens. Now that's where they got a bit muddled up. Of course, when we get into the Middle East, the pointed arches of Syria, uh, which were considered to be the product of Islam, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. The ones on the right belonged to what was a Christian church, which was uh, taken over as a mosque after the invasion of Syria. And already those pointed arches rest on Roman columns, reused. So that was one view that um, it was an inheritance from Islam and from the East. And the other was that it had arisen in England itself by crossing over round arches. So these notions and controversies were confused. For example, the coming of the appointed arch to England had been accurately dated, but there were some who had one view of its origin and the other, and some had the other. And it now appears that both views had some merit. Going back to Rickman, it's probably no coincidence that he'd been an apothecary and then a physician before he took to architecture. He dealt with some sort of a personal crisis by strolling the countryside, making drawings of the medieval buildings he came across. While preparing this lecture, I happened to read an intriguing comment by Nicholas Penny, the former director of the National Gallery in London in a fairly recent review of a book on history in the age of romanticism, he remarked that Rickman seems to have looked at buildings with the neutrality appropriate for the student of natural history. His subject was the way that architecture evolved. And it's tempting to wonder whether reading him, it may have been easier to conceive of the evolution of species. Rickman had not only identified a succession of distinctive styles in the medieval buildings of England, but he'd also began to notice transitional features, suggesting how the styles developed from each other. We don't know whether Charles Darwin or Alfred Russell Wallace had read Rickman's book, but the possibility is intriguing. Influence or zeitgeist. It's worth remembering that Rickman's perambulations came before the age of the railway, and yet he was able to collect a sufficiently large sample to make generalisations that have endured. That required a significant number of examples within a limited area, perhaps aided by a few published images. Rickman's discovery has significant resemblances to this discoverer, to, to Smith's geological map. Only in England was there a complex but coherent geology in such a small space. A similar examination of North America at that time would never have yielded that foundation of modern geology. Similarly, Rickman could hardly have achieved such coherence in continental Europe or anywhere else. We're taught these days to discount the great man theory to explain fitful leaps forward in any field of human endeavour, but there are times when there is a right man in the right place. Whether or not it was Isaac Newton at the fall of an apple in autumn, or Alexander Fleming looking twice at a contaminated petri dish, or William Smith collating his maps of the surface rocks of Great Britain, and digging parallel canals and noticing that he was going through the same strata miles apart, or, or wandering the lane, or Thomas Rickman wandering the laneways of northern England. So some undoubtedly stood on the shoulders of giants, but some were giants themselves. Now everybody here knows more about botany and zoology than I do, so I'll lead you gently into the field of nosology. The field, the science of identifying diseases, and then into a con 
tested realm that I know best, that of psychiatric nosology. After Lacroix, the customary ordered chaos of the medical professions prevailed. There was a hunt for the nimble syndrome, the identification of definite diseases, and a chaos of nomenclature, some preferring a definitive label, like encephalitis lethargica, or pertussis, or variola, or peritophytis. Some wanted a binary system, like encephalitis lethargica, or diabetes insipidus. Others would honour discoverers eponymously, Parkinson's disease, Sydenham's career, Chaco Murray tooth syndrome, when there were multiple discoverers. In 1893, an international conference in Europe sought some uniformity to make an accumulation of statistics on causes of death for the purpose of comparison meaningful. They managed to get organised uh, with some attempt at, at using the same nomenclature by 1900. The World Health Organisation was founded by the United Nations after the Second World War and the organisation took over the project. They renamed the sixth edition of the International Classification of Causes of Death. They called it the International Classification of Diseases and Causes of Death. It was to include all diseases, whether they were fatal or not. The eighth edition of ICD in 1967 introduced a glossary of mental disorders but there was still no certainty what, that what a British psychiatrist called schizophrenia and what an American colleague strongly imbued with the Freudian doctrine meant by the term. And there was even more confusion about the other versions of mental suffering. A binational project in the 1960s attempted to overcome the difficulty so that researchers at least could communicate with mutual comprehension, whatever the conditions at the coalface were thinking. The enterprise culminated in the Research Diagnostic Criteria, RDC, of 1982, a tool for valid comparative research. But where the trouble really began for clinicians was when similar notions informed the third edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, shortened to DSM-3. You can see the glossary was a slim volume. DSM-3 is at least three centimetres thick. This Procrustean product of decades of thought soon became a substitute for thought among doctors, lawyers and administrators. Anyone can look up subsequent editions on the internet can tick a sufficiency of boxes, then apply a portentous diagnostic label to friend or foe alike. You'd imagine what a curse that is in the legal system. It's certainly a curse in medicine. To overcome the fading Freudian hegemony in the United States, the manual was determinedly atheoretical. It refused to consider causes. It was purely looking at the phenomena so psychiatry had been pushed back to the 18th century search for the nimble syndrome, a search for categories based on their signs and symptoms. This was because of the psychoanalyst's belief that they had a system that could explain anything that didn't result from a demonstrable physical lesion or a toxin affecting the brain. So now half the human race are on the spectrum the other half have ADHD, and some have both. Everyone who's ever had something bad happen to them has got post-traumatic stress disorder. Anyone whose mood varies occasionally must be bipolar. The United States had discovered mental disorders that had long been familiar on the other side of the pond, 
and as Freudian fundamentalism began to fade, some of the DSM labels became a great comfort to the shareholders of the pharmaceutical industry. This coca colonization of psychiatry has had huge consequences. Pain and suffering has been abolished. Instead, there's a mental disorder called adjustment disorder. All entrenched unhappiness had become depression and the remedy was antidepressants. The trouble is it wasn't. The DSM system has been a boon for research, but arguably a curse for the practitioner at the coalface, who has to find patterns in the assessment of cases that would inevitably fall victim to the exclusion clauses of the researchers. Jacob Bronowski, um, in a talk on the BBC years ago, told a story about a time when he was working at the Salk Institute in California, and they were applying the rather rudimentary um, computer technology of the time to the problem of trying to work out whether a collection of fossil teeth belonged to one or more species. It turned out that practically everybody in the research unit was able to apportion the sets of teeth to three species. The janitor of the unit could do it as well, but the computer program couldn't. Well, the DSM system's gone on from bad to worse, got progressively thicker in both senses of the word. <laughs> on the right are the few attempts of a few people who still think to do something about it. So 2013 was when the rock really set in. Now, the curse of classification is superficial similarities. We have here a most beautiful Art Deco vase which could have been made between the wars, but it wasn't, not, those, not the wars that we know about. It could date from somewhere in the first or second century AD. Biologists know the problem. Um, Mrs. Aveline, I'm told, uh, lived in the same area where the, the lady who discovered the fossils at Lyme Regis lived. I wonder if they knew each other. Now this curse of superficial similarity in medicine diseases resulting in a copious production of urine were called diabetes. When the only way a physician could work out, could test the fluid was by tasting it, the two diseases were discriminated. If it tasted sweet, it was diabetes mellitus, honey urine. If it tasted watery, it was diabetes insipidus. The pathological basis of the two conditions is totally different. They've got no relation to each other. Now, the present DSM view of depressive illness is remarkably similar to that of the 19th century physician with a patient who wheezed too much. People are unhappy for a whole range of reasons, some of which are biochemical and many of which are in the world in which they inhabit. There are four principal dangers in classifying things. They're rarefication, making a thing out of something that isn't a thing. Fossilisation, under-inclusion and over-inclusion. Rarefication means making a mental concept into a thing. So the construct becomes a fact. A useful concept becomes unarguable. Rarefied concepts 
tend to be heavily defended, first by their begetters and then by their disciples until they become fossilised, literally set in stone. So they isolate people like Professor S. Warren Carey in Hobart, who persisted in the belief that there was something called continental drift. Eventually the world found, finds out he was right all the time. Under inclusion is a particular disease of medical research. To get a valid result, you need certified herd tested cases and the human race rarely obliges with those. The results are valid for what they do and they produce useful background for clinicians at the coalface. But they're probably dealing with patients with forms frust, with incomplete collections of symptoms with multiple comorbidities and with socio-economic problems. The great London physician and teacher M. H. Papworth coined the term diagnostic greed for a tendency to avoid a diagnosis until all the features are in evidence. At its worst, of course, under inclusion it underpins racism and discrimination against minorities of every description. Over-inclusion in medicine leads to the prescription of antibiotics for self-evidently viral diseases on which they have no influence and of antidepressants for every variety of human misery when there's no sta stable abnormality in the biochemical substrate. This is called halo phenomenon and it bedevils all the sciences but is a particular hazard in medicine. There are great and original thinkers and investigators in the world. Over-inclusion gives cred to the fleas that bite them. At least in the world of natural phenomena, there may be localised species. There may be widespread agreement about their nature and their names. In the field of architectural style, indispensable in the understanding of architectural history, many predicaments have arisen. First, there are national characteristics. In 1840, the possibility of the South Island of New Zealand becoming French was a close-run thing. It was a matter of, I think, eight days before the British got in. A company had been formed in France to purchase land for settlement on the Banks Peninsula near Christchurch, and the Akarara settlement was an Anglo-French condominium for, for nine years during which Monsieur Amable Langlois built a cottage that can be compared with its contemporaries in Van Diemen's Land. Although you would probably not find its twin in France, as the early colonial cottages remaining in Tasmania are incurably British, it's incurably French. The similarities are obvious, but so are the differences. So it went on. Through the later periods, very definite national differences. The French appreciated Edward the Seventh and he appreciated them, but the Entente Cordiale didn't produce much Edwardian architecture. In Australia we converted the fashionable English urban style, oddly called Queen Anne at the time, into bungalows, roofed it with Marseille tiles at first imported from France, and then we called it Federation. There's the habit of many notions of giving dynastic or political names to stylistic periods. We talk about Elizabethan, Georgian, Victorian, Louis Cairns, First and Second Empire, Manueline, Federal, Ming, Tang, and so on. What is it that comes into your mind when you hear the word Regency? Do you think of striped wallpaper? Or Georgette Hire novels? Or Jane Austen? Or Beau Brummel? 
as you can see, the Regency was a, a strict historical period, but stylistically much looser. But the important thing is for us to remember that Tasmania wasn't a Georgian colony, it was a Regency one, as far as style was concerned. So what do you think about? Do you think of the Prince's excesses at Brighton? Do you think of his favourite architects in around Regent's Park or in other parts of London? Do you think more of things like this at um, Sidmouth? Do you think of iron balconies? This is a villa that JMW Turner designed for himself. And then there were the revival styles beginning to emerge because of the French invasion of Egypt. Um, one of the leaders of the Napoleonic Commission that were to examine Egypt managed to get home and publish before the official version. And he published just before the brief interlude in the Napoleonic Wars called The Peace of Amiens. During that time his book was translated and published in England and so his influence came there and emerged first in this weird building in, that used to stand in Piccadilly and then influenced by that an even weirder building that still stands at Penzance and one or both of these gave rise to the synagogue in Hobart. So while the tail end of the 18th century was happening in the UK, what was happening in Van Diemen's Land? Roughly contemporary buildings. G.P. Harris was the Assistant Surveyor General of um, New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land and he settled in Hobart uh, in the early 1800s and died in 1810 so we can be quite sure that um, anything he says goes back well into that era. That was his own drawing of his house which he sent home to his mother. Now this is um, Regency of the kind that uh, Jane Austen would have approved of. She didn't approve of patched on bows like that at Circular Head. Most buildings weren't bow fronted but they were still Regency. It was the time when revivals began to come, originating in the middle of the 18th century and in full flowering during our early years. So we have Greek revival buildings in Tasmania. Now I'll give you an example of Flocky Nauki Neheli pilification. The English historian of architecture and gardens, Timothy Mole, 30 years ago had the temerity to suggest that there was a distinctive style that flowered briefly between the Regency and the time of Queen Victoria and he called it William Main. The splitting of this particular hair is particularly useful in Tasmania and the 2022 volume of the Society's Papers and Proceedings contains my paradoxical defence and possible extension of the term. So just to prepare you for the boredom of reading that, we see that both of our early architects 
were influenced by this new Italian fashion which had emerged in the United Kingdom. John Lee Archer, or at least one of his assistants, produced this original St John's Church at Ross. It had unsound foundations and had to be pulled down and replaced, so it's no longer there. But James Blackburn's former independent chapel at Newtown is still there, standing on top of the hill and looking very Italian. Where did these ideas come from? Well, from France again. Um, an early example near Paris, 1806. Then J.B. Papworth, who was a very influential publisher of architectural designs, there in 1818, and it was still going strong 20 years later. One of the first examples to appear in the, these far Antipodean colonies was Woolmers, the new front that um, uh, William Archer applied to the front of his father's house. Dad's house was built in 1818, so it was fairly primitive. William had been sent off to England to learn how to be an architect, and he came back and one of the first things he did was this. Later on, he became even more Italianate, and that little chapel at St Leonard's on Station Road could well be the earliest real Italianate building in Australia. And of course, the style is now so familiar from the Victorian era throughout every part of Australia that we take no notice of it, but it probably was a great shock to the system in those days. And later, of course, he produced the biggest country house in Australia at Mona Vale, which was highly Victorian. The other bloke born on the Norfolk Plains within about a year of, um, of Archer was William Henry Clayton. And William Clayton did a few things around Launceston. He gave us the quadrant, for instance, and there are some buildings of his around here. But when he went to New Zealand, he became the colonial architect, the only one they ever had. And he built this little Italianate post office quite, quite late on, 1864, at Oamaru in the South Island. There was a brief time when Tasmania was influential James Blackburn and his son went to the new colony at Port Phillip Bay. The Church of England got some land at East Melbourne, had to wait a while before they could afford to build. And Blackburn and son produced this very William Main building in Melbourne one of the few that are on the Australian continent. And then there was Horace Bennett, the nefarious character who briefly blew through Launceston and gave us enough of the town hall for Peter Mills to finish it. He borrowed Andrew Jackson Downing's Cottage Residences, a very popular book, from the library of Launceston Mechanics Institute and we're told he failed to return it. <laughs> but he produced Northbrook Longford for Edward Archer in 1862. So a fairly distinctive style, but there are lots of other discoveries to be made based on this peculiar idea of the William Ain. Why, for example, does a Gothic cottage have such a flat roof so early on? Probably. Why does this one have such a flat roof? Why doesn't it look Georgian anymore, as early as it is? <laughs> 
These and other mysteries are the sort of things that one can find by splitting hairs. So I hope we've um, confused you sufficiently for one afternoon and I thank you for your coming.